Hello, this is Kelly Eversole from the International Wheat Genome Sequencing Consortium, and I'd like to welcome all of you to our first webinar. Uh, we've launched a new webinar series this year, and you're on for the first one. So just to remind everyone, um, we have almost uh, 3,000 members. Anyone can be a member. And I'd like to thank all of our financial sponsors for making this webinar possible. Um, as part of the IWGSC 2.0 vision, our goal is to enhance breeding through an increased understanding of the molecular basis of traits and their allelic diversity. And that is part of the reason why we wanted to start a webinar series to begin to advance this vision. Um, our activities in 2020 include uh, quite a bit of activities related to our vision, including the expansion of the IWGSC Arbor Biosciences collaboration, uh, continued effort on uh, IWGSC RefSec V2.0 and our annotation, and then, of course, as I mentioned, launching this webinar series. So today, I am very pleased to introduce Yves Desmet from VIB uh, in uh, Belgium. And he's going to be talking today about understanding abiotic stress signaling in wheat through phosphoproteomics. So I want to thank you for your participation. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Eve. So also welcome from my side to this to this webinar where indeed I will be talking a little bit about how we approach uh, abiotic stress signaling in wheat through our uh, phosphoproteomics uh, approaches. But before kind of really going into the scientific details, I want to start with a little side project uh, where there is also a little association with wheat that I've been developing with uh, with a friend of mine where we basically try to capture the, the biological diversity of fruits and vegetables and crops and such as, such as uh, grain crops, such as wheat, uh, by looking at art, predominantly looking at, uh, at paintings. And we then try to uh, combine this uh, artistic information, uh, kind of provided by my friend who is an art historian, with the molecular biology underlying some of these processes to try and find explanations to, for example, uh, why wheat uh, used to be basically tall. And if you look at this painting of, of Bruegel in the, the mid 16th century, you see that the size of this grain crop is nearly the size of a, of a person. Uh, in order to do that for a wide variety of uh, fruits, vegetables and crops, uh, we would like to ask for everybody's participation in going to museums, museum, going to um, mansions, castles, and look at the art that is presented there, mainly then paintings, uh, and try to send us uh, pictures or information on these, uh, on these works so we can uh, assemble uh, an amount of material which then allows us to draw conclusions in the context of uh, wheat, for example, this is when do we see that, that wheat becomes more or less uh, knee height. So with this, this uh, little uh, introduction aside, I would like to, to move into the actual topic of this uh, webinar, where I want to mainly focus on wheat that is currently under, uh, under stress. There is a number of biotic stresses that are uh, tackling our uh, wheat crops uh, in the field. Uh, I will not really go into these. I will mainly focus on abiotic stresses and then predominantly temperature stress, cold and, uh, and heat stress, a little bit of mineral stress uh, and uh, some, some drought stress uh, is also what we, are, what we are looking into. And it, it's becoming clear on why this is, is important uh, if we're looking at, uh, at this graph where we see that there is a dramatic uh, yield loss in, uh, in wheat, but also a number of, uh, of other crops upon uh, abiotic uh, stress. So we really need to uh, understand and tackle this, uh, this problem. If we specifically zoom in into the impact that high temperature 
has on uh, wheat yields, there have been uh, analysis and predictions that actually say that per degree increase, we are expecting a 6% decrease in uh, wheat yields. So if the, the climate continues to change as it is changing now, this will have dramatic impacts on uh, wheat yields and overall food security. So we really need to try and understand how plants are dealing with this and how we can, can essentially prepare plants with these uh, changes in mind. So what we are mainly focusing on um, is temperature stress, as I said. We are, we are doing this in a number of plant species, including uh, wheat. Uh, and in our uh, research, we are trying to look for the really early signaling and perception mechanisms that are associated with this uh, stress conditions. So we're not explicitly looking at the physiological and developmental changes, but we are actually trying to capture um, the early mechanisms that lead to these uh, responses, hoping to identify a number of very specific factors that are controlling these uh, processes. And I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. In addition to looking at these early signaling uh, events, we are looking at protein level signaling. So we are ignoring largely, of, of course, uh, to uh, obtain these proteins, we need to go to the, through the DNA, RNA uh, phases, but we are predominantly focusing on the protein levels. And we are focusing on these proteins as a whole. So we are looking at what is uh, happening with respect to the whole uh, proteome. And we try to kind of capture differences upon uh, different stress conditions. And one added complexity to this is that you can imagine that you have a number of proteins that uh, make up this uh, proteome, this protein pool. And if it would be that simple, it would be reasonably straightforward to try uh, and uh, capture this. Unfortunately, there are a number of uh, post-translational modifications that impact on each and every protein that are, are either reversible or irreversible, and that include hydroxylation, uh, acetylation, methylation, ubiquitination, uh, and also phosphorylation that control uh, activities, localization, and so forth of these uh, proteins. So all these modifications together in the context of uh, the proteome dramatically and exponentially increase the number of potential proteins that are available. And it is these uh, uh, proteins that were actually controlling, as I said, very specific processes. So what we are interested in, in the context of, of signaling at the moment is very specifically one of these uh, modifications, which is phosphorylation. So the activity of kinases and phosphatases that lead to uh, the post-translational modification of predominantly serine, uh, threonine and tyrosine, a little bit of histidine as well in plants, uh, that will then control uh, the activity, the turnover, the localization, crosstalk, conformational changes and protein-protein interactions of all of these uh, proteins in plants. So we know that uh, kinases and phosphatases play an important role and that they have uh, numerous targets. But what we are uh, aiming to capture is of course very subtle changes in sometimes uh, one particular organ or even one particular cell that will impact on uh, these particular proteins. So in order to do that, we need to really enrich for these uh, phosphorylated uh, proteins. And therefore, we, we spent some time in, in developing and optimizing a workflow that works uh, really well in our hands, where we are starting with uh, the raw plant material, seedlings, uh, flowers, uh, any kind of organ that you can imagine subjected to, uh, for example, a, a stress condition for a given amount of time. We then extract the proteins and we digested these with specific proteases into small peptides. And these peptides will then be uh, a composition of the, of the proteome 
and we have then phosphorylated and non-phosphorylated ones. Since these uh, phosphorylation events are really kind of happening at, at uh, substoichiometric uh, numbers, we really need to enrich specifically for these uh, phosphopeptides in order to maximize the chances to actually identify these using uh, mass spectrometry, which is then obviously the next step where we uh, do our uh, analysis of uh, the different phosphopeptides by looking at uh, MS, MS2 spectra to gain some sort of idea of the diversity of phosphopeptides that are present in our complex samples. To the extent possible, we also try to normalize the phosphopeptide abundance in the context of uh, protein levels, because you can imagine that a change in uh, protein in, in the level of a phosphorylated protein can in, on the one hand be due to altered kinase or phosphatase activity, but it can obviously also be due to an overall change in abundance of, uh, of the protein. So we, we are trying to the extent possible to really capture as much uh, as possible those uh, proteins that are controlled by kinases and uh, phosphatases, which is then giving us insight in uh, conditionally regulated uh, phosphocytes. And one of the, the important prerequisites in, in order to do this is, of course, a well annotated genome. So we, we really need a genome which is then translated into uh, a proteome in order to map our uh, spectra to, uh, to, these, uh, to these proteins. And, and to illustrate that, the importance of that is that if we look at the recent uh, RefSec version 1 of, of the wheat uh, genome, this kind of dramatically increased to, to 30 to 35% of the identifications in, uh, in our samples, which, which seems to correlate with the increase in the number of uh, entries compared to earlier versions of that, uh, of that genome. So this is really, really a kind of important starting point that we need. We need a good genome in order to um, identify and map our uh, phosphopeptides. And once we have all these uh, phosphopeptides, we, uh, we developed together with uh, colleagues within, within the VIB, uh, this plant PTM viewer, uh, where we not only uh, incorporate our phosphor phosphorylation events, but we also have a number of other modifications that are embedded in a number of different uh, species where you can go and search for your uh, favorite protein and see if you can find some phosphorylation, ubiquitination, and so on in a particular con uh, condition. So this is freely available to everybody who is interested in looking at, uh, at PDMs, at, uh, at proteins. So the way we then uh, approach this in, in a more uh, specific uh, kind of questions that we're trying, trying to answer is that we, we look for uh, relevant candidates and candidates in this context uh, means phosphopeptides that are of course belonging to a particular protein and the data that, that we get out of that is uh, essentially uh, twofold. So on the one hand, if we look or if we observe the differential phosphorylation of uh, uh, a protein, we assume that this protein likely plays an important role in the process that we are, that we are studying. So we use this as a proxy to then try and validate the role of this particular protein uh, in, in wheat by looking at uh, loss of function lines, for example, um, and then see if it has a particular phenotype in the context of the process that we are studying. In addition, we also have a second layer of information because we very specifically know which uh, amino acid was phosphorylated upon a particular uh, trigger. So we can also start to uh, to interfere with uh, this amino acid, for example, by mutating a particular serine into an alanine, so it can no longer be uh, phosphorylated. And then we can try to assess the functionality of this, uh, of this particular protein in the context of our process of, uh, of interest. Of course, wheat is a very important crop and I think the, the tools that uh, have been developed including the genome, including mutant populations uh, and so on and so forth uh, in, in recent years now really uh, allow us to do 
functional and rather fast functional uh, analysis in uh, in this crop however this is still not uh, at uh, at the speed of analysis uh, as for example in the model plant uh, the dicot model plant uh, arabidopsis where we can then exploit all the information and all the tools that are available in this uh, model plant to really try and gain a faster understanding of the mode of action of uh, our protein of interest that we had identified in, in wheat. One major ad advantage in contrast to uh, approaches in the past where one identified a protein in Arabidopsis and then tran translated or tried to translate this knowledge to relevant crops is that we are now with our approach are really immediately identifying the relevant candidate in wheat which we can then uh, very easily implement in uh, functional studies but also in uh, breeding approaches and, and, and so on. So I will now try to give a couple of examples uh, that uh, really look into, uh, into this methodology in a little bit more detail and kind of give you an overview of what, what we can actually do with uh, proteomics and phosphoproteomics based uh, approaches. So one example is where we look at a difference in protein level and see if we can correlate this with a particular feature of, uh, of the wheat plant or the wheat seedling. And for this first analysis, we focused on, on these three species, uh, one tetraploid and two hexaploid uh, wheat varieties, which at the seedling stage look rather similar, but as an adult plant, uh, obviously are, are different. So the, uh, the tetraploid and the, the capelli one and the uh, hexaploid uh, Pavon uh, 6076, uh, they kind of grew up to rather tall plants. Uh, the USU apogee is a variety that was developed to stay rather small and have, have a fast cycle. So the idea was here to, to see if we can, at the seedling stage, already identify uh, proteins that are altered in their abundance and that might have predictive power towards how the adult plant will actually uh, actually look like. So if we look at uh, the proteome for these three uh, species, we, we see that there indeed there is a large overlap of the proteins that we can identify in our analysis, but there are also a number of, uh, of differences. There are a number of proteins that we only see in either one of these uh, varieties. On the other hand, there are uh, overlapping proteins that we identify either in uh, the tall uh, versus the, the small one. So this kind of indicates that indeed we might be able based on a very early capturing of uh, the proteome to identify proteins that can then predict the, the future uh, appearance and behavior uh, of, uh, of this plant. So one, one example, a couple of examples here in this diagram where these proteins are uh, visualized in this heat map, where we have blue for low abundance and yellow for high abundance, we see indeed that there are uh, obvious uh, groups of proteins that are clearly different between the tetraploid and the hexaploid varieties in this uh, group 2 and group uh, 5. But we also see that there are a number of proteins that are different between the two uh, tall varieties and the small one, both uh, up and, uh, and down regulated. Which is kind of suggesting that indeed we might be able to identify predictor proteins for the growth behavior of these uh, plants. One other example that came out of this data set, and there uh, I, I focus on one protein that was uh, associated with salt stress, gave us an, uh, an indication that maybe these uh, two hexaploid varieties might have differential sensitivity to salt stress. And indeed, when we, uh, when we tested this, we could show that uh, one of the varieties, the Pavon 76, is much more sensitive to a salt treatment than, uh, than the other one. And this basically uh, came out of a differential level 
of a particular protein that we observed already at, uh, at the seedling stage. Indeed, for the supporting that we can identify uh, predictor proteins for abiotic stress and uh, growth potential uh, already very early on in these plants. A second example, and this is then uh, much more associated with the main research that is going on in my, uh, in my lab, is uh, the early temperature responsive wheat phosphoproteome that we are uh, trying to capture. So if we look at the impact of uh, an increase in temperature on these two uh, wheat varieties, we see that if we have a, a rather mild increase in temperature, there is this uh, growth promoting effect, which is comparable uh, with what we see in, for example, Arabidopsis, where the, the hypocotyl starts to elongate, where the petioles, the, the, the Start, start to elongate and the leaves start to angle upwards to increase uh, the cooling capacity. Also here we see that uh, these plants when they are exposed or these seedlings when they are exposed to a higher temperature are growing uh, somewhat faster and are developing uh, somewhat faster so their leaf development goes, uh, goes faster. At a given temperature uh, this becomes too high and we then ob uh, observe that we see uh, as, as for example Chinese spring at 36 degrees that this temperature becomes really limiting uh, and that we hardly get uh, any growth. So there is this clear uh, optimal uh, growth temperature for uh, these varieties and this tends to uh, differ uh, amongst uh, different varieties and I'll, I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later uh, as well. Now the idea was to see if we can actually capture um, the regulatory proteins that are underlying this uh, growth behavior. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, we are really interested in early signaling and perception mechanisms. And the reason why we are interested in that is uh, because the assumption that we have is that if we look very early in the signaling pathway, we are able to capture trigger specific uh, proteins. If you have an impact on, uh, on growth, the general uh, responses, transcriptional changes preceding that uh, and the transcription factors regulating that are very often recruited by uh, multiple pathways. So there are multiple triggers that feed on this core machinery that uh, regulates growth. But we are really trying to capture the components that are very specifically regulated by temperature. So the quicker we can capture these changes, the more likely we are to find very specific uh, proteins, phosphoproteins, signaling cascades uh, in this uh, environmental stress response. And this, this really implies looking within, uh, within the hour, within minutes after exposing plants uh, to, this, to this trigger. And for example, here what we did is uh, we exposed uh, seedlings and adult plants to uh, an increase in temperature to 34 degrees. And we already observed that uh, heat shock proteins are very rapidly transcriptionally upregulated. So here we already see uh, very high fall changes after 30 minutes, but we also observed this uh, much earlier. Uh, than these 30 minutes, which is really suggesting that signaling events associated with this uh, response, this transcriptional uh, response, uh, are preceding this, uh, this trigger. So we really try to look for changes within, uh, within the hour. And uh, one experiment that we have done comparing uh, wheat leaves uh, and ears and spikelets uh, after exposing them to one hour of high temperature, really captures a number of proteins that are very specific for, uh, for this response. And in order to explain this uh, rather complex uh, result in a little bit more detail, I will slowly walk you through it. So we start, of course, with our uh, MS analysis, where we then subsequently identify proteins and we predominantly use Max quant as a way to uh, identify proteins based on our on our spectra, uh, and this allows us to capture a number of uh, of phosphosets. And we then try to focus on those that are uh, quantifiable, uh, 
And as you can see here, uh, regardless of, of the organ, we predominantly capture uh, serine phosphorylation, as, as is uh, illustrated here in this pie chart. Uh, and we have also a portion of uh, threonine and tyrosine uh, phosphorylation. Now, when I say quantifiable proteins, uh, this, this is a rather important concept because uh, when we want to apply statistics uh, to this, we obviously need uh, in both our conditions the same phosphopeptide detected in a number of independent biological replicates. So here we have a number of independent biological replicates. First example gives you the same phosphopeptide detected in all our control and all our treatment samples. There are a number of situations where we sometimes do not detect it in uh, one biological uh, uh, replicate. But if we have sufficient values, we can still subject these uh, to statistical analysis and look for uh, phosphorylation events where there is a small up or down uh, regulation with respect to that uh, phosphorylation. On the other hand, there are uh, examples where we do not detect one particular phosphopeptide uh, in one treatment and then do detect it in the other treatment, which is really a black and white situation, which uh, limits, of course, statistical analysis because we don't have values in one of these conditions, but on the other hand also uh, reflects a very important change because this particular uh, phosphopeptide only appears in one condition. So this is very, very likely a very important uh, regulatory component uh, very much associated with the condition that we are uh, looking at. So going back to this workflow, we then do find in our uh, data set a number of phospho uh, sites, phosphopeptides that are really only present in either the control or the treatment uh, condition, uh, which we then also uh, include in our subsequent analysis. And then, of course, we have a number of uh, values where we can do statistical analysis on and can really look at uh, the phosphorylation profile uh, in, in our treatment. So then we have a pool of uh, unique proteins and a pool of uh, significant uh, proteins based on statistics that we can then use for further detailed analysis. And if we look at uh, our, our data, we observe uh, overlap uh, with what we can uh, identify between uh, different organs, but we also see that there is a clear distinction uh, between these different organs. And this is also uh, with respect to the, the significantly up and down regulated ones, where we see that there are a number of uh, common ones, and, and I'll come back to this a little bit later as well when we expand a bit more our data set, but there are also uh, a number of uh, likely or possibly organ uh, specific regulators, uh, specific phosphorylation events uh, that are going up uh, and down in these uh, wheat plants. So to uh, dig a little bit deeper into this early temperature responsive uh, wheat phosphoproteome, I want to give you uh, a third uh, example. And with this third example, we, uh, we actually extended our, uh, our data set by adding, in addition to, uh, to these uh, spikelets, we also added uh, developing young uh, anthers with the idea that uh, if we have these different organs that are all subjected to the same one hour uh, treatment of high temperature, this would allow us to identify the core temperature signaling uh, components uh, and maybe also further get further insight into temperature and organ specific uh, responses. And indeed, as you can see in, in, this, in this Venn diagram, there are a number of uh, proteins, phospho, uh, phosphorylated uh, proteins, phosphopeptides that are common between all of the organs, but this is a rather uh, low number. Uh, and, and these indeed reflect general temperature uh, responses, for example, uh, heat shock proteins, which are uh, responding in all of these organs. There are, of course, also a large number of uh, organ-specific ones, which is uh, kind of indicating that if we want to uh, 
get a good uh, overview, a good handle on temperature signaling, we probably need to look in uh, all of these organs uh, independently and then try to map the signaling cascades that are uh, associated with this response. Now, the way we, we approach this, and this is uh, an, an example uh, based on some of our, uh, our recent data, is that we take, uh, for, for example, seedlings, we expose them to high temperature, we subject them to this uh, phosphoproteomics workflow, we then look for uh, differential phosphorylation, and then, as I said, we use this uh, difference in phosphorylation as a proxy to, to as an indication for involvement in high temperature signaling and then based on, on the profile in our data set we identify a number of key candidates that we want to explore further which we refer to as uh, targets of temperature or dot uh, proteins and, and, and I'll give you uh, an example for one of these uh, dot proteins that we that we identified so this uh, this one which we called uh, TOT3, the phosphor status uh, of this one is regulated at high temperature, so it is less phosphorylated at high temperature, and the, the phosphopeptide that we identified belongs to uh, an uncharacterized uh, kinase domain. So with this uh, with this information, we uh, we assume that it is uh, likely that this kinase plays a role in uh, temperature mediated uh, growth so we therefore uh, gained access to a tilling population uh, at the john innes center via crystal away and we could uh, identify a number of lines which have an early stop codon which we then started to uh, characterize in a little bit more detail uh, with respect to the response to high temperature so if we look at uh, at these uh, wheat seedlings we, uh, we observe that at the optimal, more or less optimal control uh, temperature, 24 degrees, they are growing rather comparably. However, if we grow them at a uh, high temperature, and it, uh, this holds true for both of the tilling lines that we, that we looked at, the, uh, the mutant line is much more responsive to the high temperature than, uh, than our control line, which is, which is nicely indicating that indeed, based on our uh, phosphoproteome analysis, we can identify a number of, uh, of candidates and then confirm, validate this uh, with respect to the, to the actual uh, response in, in uh, warm temperature immediate growth in this case. Now, of course, to, to bypass uh, a, a little bit the uh, limitations of wheat with respect to the speed of uh, understanding the molecular responses and biochemical responses that are actually happening, we are then moving, as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, for some of our mode of action studies to Arabidopsis. And it was very nice to see that uh, if we... Uh, identify loss of function alleles in Arabidopsis, and in this case we have we have two independent alleles, we see a rather similar picture as we saw in, in, in wheat. We have no obvious uh, difference on the level of the young seedling uh, at uh, optimal uh, temperature, in this case 21 degrees, but if you look then at uh, the temperature that, that really controls Thermomorphogenesis in Arabidopsis, and this is uh, specifically elongation of the hypocotyl, the lengthening and angling of, uh, of the petioles and leaves. We do see that while our control nicely responds to this, our mutant is less responsive to, uh, to this treatment. And we can also very nicely quantify this, we can complement uh, the mutant. And so, so we, we, we can now use Arabidopsis to gain a little bit more understanding uh, of this uh, uncharacterized kinase by looking at, uh, at its interacting partners, by looking at the downstream components, by, for example, uh, doing then a new phosphoproteomics analysis on, uh, on, this, this, uh, on this mutant, which then really allows us to, to gain uh, very... 
detailed mechanistic understanding of this kinase, which we can then uh, exploit again in wheat to see to what extent uh, the, this, this protein uh, there plays an important role. And uh, with the fourth and uh, final example, uh, I want to also illustrate that uh, similarly to what I've uh, shown you with these wheat varieties in the beginning of, of my presentation, that we can also capture marker proteins for uh, temperature tolerance and, uh, and sensitivity. So as I've already shown you, the, there is a, a response to a high temperature, which is either growth promoting, uh, the development and, and the, the growth of the young seedling leaves is, uh, is affected. On the other hand, if the temperature becomes too high, uh, there is a growth repressive effect and, and we start to see um, yellowing, uh, yellowing leaves. So what we now reasoned is that if we would look at a more tolerant versus a more sensitive uh, variety, we should be able to, on the one hand, capture important regulatory uh, proteins for uh, warm temperature mediated growth and, and responses. And on the other hand, try to uh, identify markers within these uh, sensitive and tolerant varieties that reflect the behavior of these uh, plants, mature plants, to an environmental change, an increase in temperature in this case which we could then, of course, when we know which uh, of these markers plays an important role to kind of distinguish these varieties, these markers can then obviously also be used in uh, targeted breeding approaches. So we looked at this uh, sensitive and tolerant variety uh, in a little bit more detail, and this is in the context of, of leaf length uh, here, where we uh, observed that indeed for the tolerant variety, we get this kind of a uh, nice increase in growth until a certain temperature and when the temperature becomes too high uh, growth is arrested which we obviously also see in the sensitive variety but we see that the sensitive variety uh, in contrast to the growth promotion that we get in the tolerant one is uh, not doing very well already under uh, more uh, temperatures that are growth promoting in the other variety. So we see that this is becoming much more earlier growth repressive compared to the tolerant variety. So we then subjected these two varieties essentially to our phosphoproteome analysis. And while we could identify uh, a number of uh, overlapping proteins, overlapping phosphopeptides, uh, phosphorylated proteins, in these two uh, varieties, we also have a number that seem to be uh, distinct between the two. What was actually interesting uh, with respect to the, the overlapping ones that we could identify a couple of, uh, of proteins that were clearly showing opposite uh, behavior. While they were uh, either downregulated in the tolerant uh, variety, these were then upregulated in the more sensitive variety or, uh, or vice versa, which is indicating that these proteins might explain the different response of these varieties to this uh, specific temperature, uh, temperature treatment. Again, suggesting that these might be ideal breeding targets to turn this uh, sensitive uh, variety into a more tolerant variety by, for example, uh, knocking out these uh, proteins or more specifically uh, modifying the phosphorylation status of these uh, proteins in uh, these different varieties. So in, in conclusion, uh, what I have uh, shown you today during this, this webinar is that we can use the wheat uh, phosphoproteome to, on the one hand, identify uh, signaling components. And in the context of TOT3, I have illustrated uh, this with, with the temperature example. Uh, but we can also use the wheat phosphoproteome to identify novel uh, breeding markers. So if you compare 
tolerant versus sensitive varieties, we can actually look at contrasting responses and then try to uh, estimate which ones of these we need to introduce into the sensitive variety to make it tolerant or vice versa. And one of the next steps that we are that we are taking, because all the um, examples I have shown you today are associated with plant material that has been grown uh, in, in glass houses or in growth chambers, we are now trying to move this actually to the field. And then I want to end with this quote from uh, Eisenhower, who said that farming looks mighty easy when your plow is a pencil and you're a thousand miles from the cornfield and I kind of took the liberty to replace that with wheat uh, here. So we really need uh, as a next step to move all of these uh, analysis into the field and to try and capture the dynamics of phosphorylation in uh, a kind of more general context but also upon very specific uh, natural perturbations including an increase in, uh, in temperature. Which basically leaves me to end the presentation uh, with thanking the people involved, uh, which for the wheat work are mainly uh, Casio, uh, Ting Ting and, uh, and Pia. And there was some work done before uh, in the context of wheat, but mainly in the context of our phosphoproteomics uh, workflow by uh, Elizabeth uh, and, uh, and Dai. And there are of course, uh, a number of collaborators, and, and the list is, is longer than, than the ones I have put up here, that are intimately involved in, the, in this project. So if you want to know more uh, about what we are doing with respect to phosphorylation, with respect to uh, phosphoproteomics, you can, you can take a look at our website, send me an email, follow us on Twitter or, or, or Facebook, um, and Hopefully, uh, I get to hear or see one of you again at, uh, at some point. So, I want to end the presentation with taking some questions, if there are any. Um, I don't see any um, questions in the no. in our control panel. So maybe there are no detailed questions uh, or maybe more general questions that uh, that people had so <clears throat> thank you very much eve this is kelly uh, there is one question uh, what kind of database or proteome library could be used to map the proteins after ms analysis in wheat so so what what we've what we've used is the the iwgsc version one a proteome database that uh, that was generated so so that's basically the starting point uh, this is then um, in silico uh, digested and then we are uh, assessing using this MaxQuant software to map the spectra to the the in silico to the to kind of the really observed uh, peptides to the ones that are predicted uh, in silico uh, of course our our uh, assignment uh, very much relies on the quality of identifying the the proteins in this in, in this uh, genome uh, database so with further improvements to this um, with with more detailed information on which proteins can actually be uh, be predicted to to exist the identification will of course be become more uh, more uh, global Then I have one question, Eve, you mentioned about going, you're really the next step is to translate this work to the field. Yeah. Um, what, are, what do you see as those next steps? So, so what, what, what we're doing now, because if, you, if, you, if you're doing this in a, in a very much controlled environment, uh, you're really simplifying your, uh, your system. Because if you, if, you, if you look at a field, uh, there are so many combined uh, stresses that are acting on these uh, on these plants that uh, this all needs to be integrated. So what we are currently doing in, in, in the lab is only varying the temperature response and all the rest is 
rather controlled and rather sterile. So we, we, we try not uh, to have uh, biotic stresses. We try not to have broad stress in uh, together with this uh, high temperature stress. So we really try to very specifically look for what is affected by we we also have uh, the microbiome in, in in the soil that will impact we will have uh, various biotic and abiotic stress conditions that will impact the growth behavior um, and the responses of these plants which of course if you then on top add uh, a temperature stress this 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 all needs to be very much integrated uh, so we now instead of trying to do this under very much controlled conditions we are really trying to grow plants in the field and then monitor the conditions as much uh, as possible and then impose uh, a temperature stress in a more natural uh, setting great i don't see any other questions at this time so Eve, I'd like to thank you again for a great webinar and for kicking off the IWGSC webinar series. And I'd also like to thank all of those who have attended today and who will be looking at the video in the future. So thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye.